the first in an Advent series based on one of the most nuclear, explosive passages in all of the Bible. The Word, Logos, became flesh, Pathos, and dwelt among us, Ethos. And then the final Sunday in Advent. And we beheld his glory. Theos, the wonder, the marvel, the mystery of Christmas. Four Sundays in Advent, each Sunday devoted to a different theme in this one explosive passage of Scripture. The word Logos became flesh, pathos, and dwelt among us, ethos. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, Theos. As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. This is the first Sunday in Advent, Lent Talk 140. This is the beginning, the 27th of November, 2022, the beginning of the Advent season. It's hard to believe, but it is here. And I'm glad you're here. And it's an honor for me to be here with you and share some of these thoughts that that I have. I've been doing this uh, now for 140 Sundays straight with a couple of, of subs, and I appreciate that, but almost all of them. Uh, every week I've been with you, and many of you every week have been with me, and I'm so grateful for your, pa- your patience, your forbearance, your loyalty, and um, especially those that, that support this ministry through Preach the Story and subscribing and not just subscribing, which I appreciate all of our subscribers, but those of you that can be partners in this in this ministry. The readings today, Isaiah, we have Psalms, we have Romans, and, um, and then we have Matthew 24, 36 to 44. And I'm gonna I'm gonna start with that because it's it's a um, it's kind of paradox. We're gonna talk about paradox a little bit today, but it's it's a paradox that we get ready to celebrate Christ's first coming by remembering his second coming. And this is how we are enjoined by this this passage to. Um, but about that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven or the sun but only the Father. This is a, a very early um, kind of a, a gotcha question that every Christian kid learns. Did Jesus know everything? Oh, yes, Jesus knew everything. Well, no, he didn't know everything. He didn't know one thing. He did not know the date when he was returning. So every um, we all learned that either at summer camp or at Sunday school or something. It's the, it's the gotcha, a gotcha question. Um, This is also a a summons to awake, to stay awake. Now, that word woke is uh, is politically charged today. So um, you've got the anti-woke and the pro-woke, and and you've probably got them both in your congregation. So I I might, to call this sermon the Great Awakening may not be the best idea. But but it is another way of talking about uh, stay awake. It means pay attention, pay attention. Um... You never know when Christ is going to appear, when you're going to be ambushed by the Almighty. And and so you need to live in a constant state of expectancy. In fact, uh, I wrote a whole book on this called Nudge. The pay attention is another way of talking about prayer. Uh, Prayer is just paying attention. 
And it's also being open. This is the this is the Advent hope here that, that comes to fulfillment of Christmas, that at any moment, anything can happen and probably will. That you'd have to be expected to 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 lightning strikes from from God and 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 being being ambushed by beauty and goodness and truth and so but what we're going to do here this is the first week in this series we're we're doing an advent series on this passage of scripture that um changed the world maybe arguably the most revolutionary passage in any literature of all time the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Now we're starting today with the word. And that means we got to deal with Logos. Next week we'll deal with, became flesh, pathos. The whole meaning of the incarnation. Carne, carne, carnal means flesh. Carne. Pathos. The pathos. And then the ethos. And, and dwelt among us, tabernacled with us. And what does it mean that... Jesus is the new temple, and we're called to be temple. So, ethos. And then finally, the week before, um, the Christmas Day, the last Sunday of Advent, the one I'm looking to forward to in many ways the most, the theos, that and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, the, the joy, the, the marvel, the, the mystery, the miracle of of what it means to be in Christ and all that that all that that means, but today, logos. How do we understand logos? This is one of the most important Greek words. And let me say that every for two thousand years, people have been trying to translate this word. And what you have in your Bible is the kind of the consensus translation meaning word. But the problem is when you hear the word word. You think of words. Jesus as the word. Okay, Jesus is Logos. But So how do you translate Logos? Well, some translate it reason. Some translate mind. Some translate, no, no, no. It has more of an embodiment quality to it with some, with some orality to it. So it's got to be like voice um, or sound. Or in the beginning was the sound. In the beginning was the voice. Um, um, Logos. How, how in the world do you do it? Finally... And I, I've been following this person for um, a while in his translation of Logos. His name is David Bentley Hart. He's probably the most, you've heard from, if you've been a part of these, these, these Len Vo, uh, vlogs, Len Talks, you know I've quoted him before. Sometimes good, sometimes I'm arguing with him. But his, he has a literal translation from the Greek into English, which I really like. I mean, it, it really kind of bears it down and and doesn't you, there's no interpretation you're just getting a little greek and when it comes time for when it comes time for him to translate this word logos he just throws up his hands he says i can't do it it's untranslatable you just can you just got to say logos because it every translation that you come up with is a um is a traduction uh, uh traducing it traduces the the tradition it 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 makes it worse. Uh, you, you just got to stay with Logos, because anything you say other than Logos um, is inferior. And I went with that until recently. I, I'm reading a, uh, an article. And um, this is in a Feshra. The article is by somebody by the name of Troy Martin. And uh, Troy Martin is, is writing in this Feshra on, the, on the, the passage that... Um, is in 1 Peter 1, 22 to 23. And in this, in this passage, he, he talks, he says, how do we, how do, do you think we should best understand this word logos? And, and um, in the, um, in the passage, he makes clear that the, the best translation he thinks for this word logos. And um, you're going to, when you hear this, I hope that it will be an epiphany, an awakening for you, as it was for me. Um, 
And let me let me give you the the passage in First Peter one twenty two to twenty three. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. You ready? For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring logos. And Troy Martin teaches at Xavier University, a, a, a Nazarene scholar, teaches, has been taught, teaching at Xavier for, I guess, three decades. I'm going to read this again. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring, and we translate it, Word of God, David Van Lehar would say, no, keep it Logos. Through the enduring Logos. Um... So, what does Logos mean, he says? Um, you ready? DNA. The best way to convey what Logos means today to this culture is this is God's DNA. Jesus is the DNA of the divine. Jesus is God's DNA. Now he he uses Aristotle. I'm gonna I'm gonna move to Heraclitus in just a bit, but I'm gonna start with Aristotle. Uh, Tri Martin uses Aristotle to help us understand that this this language here of seed and and. And um, the, the, the whole concept of being born again into a whole new, new DNA. But this time, it's a DNA, a divine DNA, the divine DNA with which we were created. And, and uh, uh, this is hard. We, we, to understand this, you've got to understand Jesus is the last Adam, the first Adam, created a little lower than God. It doesn't say angels. Angels comes after we fell in the beginning. Elohim, a little lower than Elohim. And so we were created with the, in the image of God, partakers of the divine, but not divine. In other words, you can't be human without the divine. We are not divine. And, and the point, point of life is not to become divine. That's not what holiness means. It comes to be, means to become human, but you can't be human without the divine. Without this divine DNA, this divine DNA is what makes us human. And Jesus comes to do some, what we today call, recombinant engineering. To do some genetic engineering. To give us a whole, that's what, the, these whole passages. Um, that be, being, you, being born again, um, new creation. Now, this is this issue of, it's called H. E, I mean, H-G-E, heritable gene editing, or some call it heritable genetic, or some call it genomic genome editing. You're going to be hearing about, I've got to step, step away from my preaching role in a minute and just play the uh, kind of futurist role. Um, 60 nations now, there's no nation in the world where you can do H-G-E. What H-G-E is, e is, is you edit the human genetics that, so that you can pass it on by procreation to future generations. Thus you've altered and entered the gene pool forever and altered it forever. And this is called HGE. Not just, so in HGE, we take control of genetic design. In other words, we humans take over from God the role of designer um, DNA. And we introduce these human scientific genetic changes into the genetics of the human species. Um, and this is very, I, I, I believe, we're so far close to this. I think in 2023, although 60 nations now, you can't do it anywhere, but 60 nations actually on record saying you can't do it, I think one of them will. I think 2023 will be another crossing of the Rubicon where we've gone into designer humans, we've gone into... Not divine DNA here, but uh, 
biological DNA, but human design of DNA, and I think we will have crossed that um, that Rubicon. I think, and I think maybe England may be the first one to do it. That's just, but it's huge. It's it, it, we nobody's talking about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. But it is. It's almost on us. Um, I, I want to say, don't do it. Wait a minute. Let's. But there's one HGE that I'm so glad. I am so glad that God did. We didn't do it. This is divine made, not human made. And that is the incarnation. The incarnation is when God sent Jesus with the true, pure, original DNA to be among us, to be born of this Virgin Mary, have divine, have human, to be born of this Virgin Mary, to enter again into the human gene pool, this divine DNA. And, and hence the language of the, of the New Testament. You can't get rid of it. Um, we are heirs of Christ. This is Romans 8, 16 to 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and have children that heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. In other words, um, this is the, the this is the divine DNA is what gives us eternal life. We lost that in the in the garden. We were meant to be immortal, and, and our mortality, the, the coil of mortality, is what we got when we were ushered out of the garden. But Jesus brought us back in to the garden and restored to us that divine DNA that makes us human. Again, does not make us divine. Makes us human. Just a little lower than God. Just partake in the very triune life. And Jesus took that that human DNA and entered it with a divine DNA when he ascended into, into heaven. Ephesians 1.5. You can't get rid of the air language. You, you can't get rid of the adoption language. God de- decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him, I love this, great delight Oh, I'm restored. I've done this genetic engineering on the human species again. And now you can share in the DNA that we were originally designed for, this divine DNA, this this born again DNA. And a lot of people have problems with that. I don't think we can ever give give it up. Because this is Jesus to Nick by night. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. And then Nick by night, in his left brain mentality goes, I got him. He can't deal with metaphors. He's got to take it literally. I got to enter my mother's womb and be born again. Again, I got to, how do I get back in there? Are you kidding me? And then Jesus said, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, this one needs to be born again, to be born into this new, this divine DNA, the, the life of Logos. First, first Peter 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If you confess with your mouth Jesus Lord and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be born again. You'll be healed. You'll be whole. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this is 2 Corinthians 5.17, you all know this passage. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. This is the divine, divine DNA. You now are changed. So that it is no longer possible, it's no longer I who live, but Christ, the, the, God, the divine DNA, lives within me. And we can live out of that new, new DNA. Um, DNA, we, many of you are familiar with the story, I, I did a whole book on it just called So Beautiful, um, which was the words that Crick and Watson spoke. I forget which one it was, I think it was Watson. But when, in 1953, um, in a pub in Oxford, Eagles Club, 
they, they looked for the first time at what these molecules look like. This is the, the life source of humans. The, this self-replicating material present in nearly all living organisms. Um, and these chromosomes that dance together and it's a it's a double helix it's a double helix spiral and the response was that is so beautiful. it carries all the genetic information uh, the fundamental qualities of who you are and who I am and um, are carried in this DNA and the fundamental qualities of who God is and who you can be and the power and energy of the divine are now there in that. Once we become born again, heirs of Christ, children of God, adopted into his, into his, the new Adam family. Um, it is so beautiful. Jesus is the whole, that's why the Christmas story is just so beautiful. Uh, this divine DNA of Jesus the Christ who embodies the divine DNA. And is it? Is it? Is the divine DNA? So beautiful. Now Heraclitus, we're moving from now from Aristotle, because Troy Martin really looked at the Aristotelian components of this metaphor of Seed, seminal, that's why the seminary is called a seed bed. Every church ought to be a seed bed for faith. Every church ought to be a seminary where we grow and, and incubate and, um, and insulate, if you will, this divine DNA in each one of us. Um, but Heraclitus um, is known as the philosopher of Logos. Now, we, we do not have much of Heraclitus. We don't, we don't have any... Okay, Heraclitus wrote this book. There ain't any. But we have our fragments of his writings. And we have what his students said about him. And, and what the exciting thing is, new fragments are being discovered every year. What Heraclitus... Or not every year, maybe, but... Every other year. Is this new, there's a new fragment. And we get much, but we get a little more. Um, and um, the, the key thing for Heraclitus about Logos was the word, what we would put in this divine DNA, the double in the double helix. The double in the double helix. And in other words, there's always double. I mean, you have strong vision because you see with both eyes. You close one eye and you lose your depth. It's stereo. I, I just say Jesus always comes in surround sound. If you're only hearing one thing, you're not hearing Jesus because... There's this double helix. Uh, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's the lamb. I want you to be as wise as a serpent, but he's, be as innocent as a dove. I'm the prince of peace, and I came bringing a sword. He's a double. Divine DNA has this double helix structure to it. And, um, and, Heraclitus is trying to explain this to his students, not about Jesus, but just about Logos having this two, this paradoxical nature to it. it it's the ultimate. Is it, you just can't hear only one thing with Logos. You got to hear two. Um, and they aren't getting it. So then he said, "Okay, here's what I want you to do. I, I'm going to try and show you, you, know, you illustrate points, you animate stories and experiences." So, in our language today, Heraclitus moved to animation. Why don't you go get me a stick? I want you to put a notch at the end of that stick and go, me no go get me another stick just like it. Um, and, um, and bring it to me. So they did. And so he had two sticks. And one stick had one notch in it. The other stick had, he put another notch in it. And had two notches. He said, okay, I'm going to do something to this one stick here. That with this other stick... And this stick, I could kill you. Or I could heal you. He said, now, the, 
The fact that I could either kill you with it or heal you with it, that's Logos. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, Logos. I go, what in the world are you talking about? He said, go give me some cat gut. So they got him some cat gut. He notched the cat gut in the one stick and then brought that one end into relationship with the opposite end. So that now they're not just dangling there. And they're now in connection. He's connected the opposites. He's brought the paradox into connection, into relationship. And out of that relationship of both opposites being brought into connection and into communion, he takes the other stick and he goes, okay, now i got a bow and arrow that can kill you, or I have a harp that can heal you. And he said, that is Logos. Jesus, fully human and fully divine, not half human and half divine, fully human, fully divine. We believe in God is one and God is three. What's the truth? Both. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. But that's one God in three persons. We believe in both. Jesus, the Logos, who brought heaven and earth together. I am a sinner. But by the grace of God, I am a Saint, simultaneously. I'm sinner and saint. What about you? What's the truth? Both. You never get to the point of saintliness where you're not still sinner. You never get, there's no sinner so much that there's not a saint there somewhere. So there is this, this, this paradox. I say orthodoxy is paradoxy. There is this, this essence to Logos that brings the opposites together. And the, the way in which for Christmas, this Advent season, you may want to help your people with with this. And I I was reading in Christianity Today um, and for for the November issue. And I um, was reading an Andrew Wilson meditation on this this passage. And um, so I just want to I don't know, share part of it with you and add my own stuff to it. This is Revelation 22, 16. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Sometimes you say bright morning star. Um, now, I, I've mentioned before and written before about this root and offspring of David is another paradox. Jesus is the root. But at the same time, in other words, he's the source. He's the messianic source, but he is also the subject. He's the Messiah himself. He's the root and the offspring. So we got paradox right here in, in this incredible passage that introduces what is the last command of the Bible. Come, 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 drink freely of the water of life. So you've got this paradoxical, he's the source of the messianic line, and he's the subject of the messianic line. Um, and I, I just love the... the the language of I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. But what I hadn't seen, this is where Wilson helped me to see this, is the paradox in bright morning star. Um, well, what, what, what do you mean, bright morning star? Well, um, the bright morning star in the ancient world was known as the first one to appear. It was the first one to appear in the morning, and it was the last one to go at night. So it's not just the morning star, it's the evening star. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so this allusion here to the bright morning star um, it's something that's there before you, any other stars have appeared, and it's there after all the other stars have receded. Now, we know today that this star is Venus. Venus is called Earth's twin, Earth's sister, because it's not like any other stars, not like any other... It's not made of gas. It's made of rock. It's the closest of all 
the planets to Earth itself. And hence, you have this one-of-a-kind star, unparalleled, unprecedented, um, incomparable, being defined as Jesus, the divine DNA, the Logos. The, the star that is first and last in the sky, the star that is unlike any other star. But a star, this Venus, that is most like Earth, is most like us, became like us, so that he could bring to us, so that we could share with the world, the divine DNA, every time a child is born, a touchdown in eternity is scored, somebody says, I want to follow Jesus. There is heritable gene editing. And you become no longer your own, but thine you become new creatures in Christ. You become born again, heirs of the, of the kingdom. You become adopted into, it's an adoption story, adopted into the family of God. This is the meaning of Logos. Jesus, God's DNA. Touch somebody this week with that divine DNA.